I support converting a grass lawn to a gravel lawn in order to prevent lots of bugs from being born involuntarily into nasty, brutish, and short lives. If you actively manage a grass lawn, then converting to gravel also saves water, time, lawnmower noise, and in some cases even greenhouse gas emissions on balance. But how much of a difference does it really make for insects and other invertebrates if you convert a grass lawn to gravel? This video helps answer that question. Using my microscope camera, I looked for bugs in my front yard, which unfortunately is not a gravel lawn because I don't own the property. Almost every square foot of grass had some bug or other in it, often many bugs. With some exceptions, most of the bugs shown in this video don't appear to be suffering as they go through their daily lives. But most of them will experience tremendous suffering when they die, which will typically happen soon. And most insect offspring never make it to adulthood. We don't see these non-survivors as much because they're quickly eaten or otherwise disposed of, but their suffering is collectively immense. I began my search from my front doorstep. This is an interesting specimen. I think it's a leafhopper of some sort, though if I get this or any other classifications wrong, please let me know. Following is some general information about leafhoppers, but I don't know if it applies to this individual specifically. Wikipedia explains that, quote, these minute insects, colloquially known as hoppers, are plant feeders that suck plant sap from grass, shrubs, or trees. Their hind legs are modified for jumping and are covered with hairs that facilitate the spreading of a secretion over their bodies that acts as a water repellent and carrier of pheromones. Leafhoppers have piercing, sucking mouthparts, enabling them to feed on plant sap. A leafhopper's diet commonly consists of sap from a wide and diverse range of plants, but some are more host-specific. Leafhoppers mainly are herbivores, but some are known to eat smaller insects, such as aphids, on occasion. End quote. Another page adds that, quote, with an exclusive diet of plant juices, leafhoppers produce a sweet byproduct known as honeydew. This substance often inspires mutually beneficial relationships with ants, where honeydew is traded for a little ant protection. End quote. Next, you can see an ant fighting with some other bug that I haven't identified. It looks like the ant is the aggressor, but I'm not sure. I was surprised to see this fight within the first 10 minutes of filming, since I ordinarily assume that insect fights are rare, and that we mainly just see them in dramatized documentaries. But unlike what happens in some wildlife documentaries, I didn't set this up or pick this scene out from many hours of more bland footage. Maybe I should have intervened to try to stop this fight, although I also thought it would be important to capture it on video for others to see. I don't know why these particular individuals are fighting, but here's some general information on why ants fight. This source says, quote, ants may fight to protect their own nests or food storage from enemies or when they try to take over nests or seize food of not only other ant species, but also other colonies of the same species." End quote. Here on the right is another member of the species that was fighting with the ant. On the left you can see another bug pass by. To the bottom right is a bright red bug. A few days later, when I came back to film more, I was able to get a closer look at the red bug, and I think it's a red mite of some sort, maybe either a red clover mite or a red velvet mite. It looks most like a red velvet mite based on Google images, so I'll assume that's what it is. This source explains, quote, the common name red velvet mite is a somewhat generic term for a bunch of often unrelated mites that happen to be red. Scientists suspect that some of these red hairs may act as sensors in the mite's often gloomy world. 
neither adult nor immature thrombid red velvet mites bite your plants or your pets or you young red velvet mites are parasites bloodsuckers on grasshoppers daddy long legs beetles and other ground dwelling cold-blooded critters including plant hoppers apparently which they attach to and ride around on adult red velvet mites eat insect eggs and prey on very small invertebrates like ants they have an exotic love life described by scientists liam hennigan and george hammond as not to be missed a male places his sperm droplets on elevated surfaces like twigs and grass blades creating what hennigan calls a love garden and hammond possibly not a sentimentalist compares to tiny golf balls on tees then the male issues an invitation to the female in the form of an intricately woven trail of silk if she is dazzled by his artistry she will enter the garden and sit on pick up the sperm if a rival male encounters the garden he will trash it and substitute his own eggs are deposited in the soil where a newly hatched larva will find its first meal ticket and their awesome red color aposematism red is one of mother nature's warning colors used to advertise that its wearer is poisonous or distasteful or both there are accounts of intrepid researchers who consumed red velvet mites and wish they hadn't but the source of the flavor is not known End quote. this page adds quote, generally the red velvet mites are found in dry environments such as deserts but they are also found in soil litter as well as on plant leaves and logs of decaying wood the adults are essentially predators as predators they have an ability to sense their preys by means of vibrations and the different kinds of chemical substances that their preys secrete though the adults are predators themselves it is quite interesting to know that there are very few if any predators that prey on these mites this might be due to the fact that they taste really bad the adults however are known to feed on each other it has also been observed that sometimes the adult mites become the hosts for the larvae which are essentially parasites depending on the species the number of eggs laid at a time differs usually sixty to one hundred thousand eggs are laid the larvae are parasitic in nature and feed on hosts such as crickets dragonflies grasshoppers etc End quote. i think this is a weevil i found it on a dandelion flower i don't know if it was collecting pollen or merely hanging out there i brought it inside for further examination and then returned it outside afterward while filming i put it on the flower to watch it move around i found this bug injured on my front step I don't know if the source of its ill health was humans or not. I tipped it right side up and it was then able to walk. It climbed onto a bucket and stayed there. This seems to be a jumping spider. Jumping spiders are fascinating creatures, although they sadly cause immense pain to their prey. The Wikipedia article explains, quote, Jumping spiders have some of the best vision among arthropods and use it in courtship, hunting, and navigation. Although they normally move unobtrusively and fairly slowly, most species are capable of very agile jumps, notably when hunting, but sometimes in response to sudden threats or crossing long gaps. Both their book lungs and the tracheal system are well developed, and they use both systems, bimodal breathing. Jumping spiders are generally recognized by their eye pattern. All jumping spiders have four pairs of eyes, with one pair being their particularly large anterior median eyes. In addition to using their silk for safety lines while jumping, they also build silken pup tents where they shelter from bad weather and sleep at night. They molt within these shelters, build and store egg cases within them, and also spend the winter in them. Jumping spiders have four pairs of eyes, three secondary pairs that are fixed, and a principal pair that is movable. The posterior lateral eyes 
are wide-angle motion detectors, which sense motions from the side and behind. Combined with the other eyes, it gives the spider a near 360-degree view of the world. Jumping spiders are generally diurnal, active hunters. Their well-developed internal hydraulic system extends their limbs by altering the pressure of body fluid, hemolymph, within them. This enables the spiders to jump without having large, muscular legs like a grasshopper. Most jumping spiders can jump several times the length of their bodies. When a jumping spider is moving from place to place, and especially just before it jumps, it tethers a filament of silk, or drag line, to whatever it is standing on to protect itself if the jump should fail. Should it fall, for example, if the prey shakes it off, it climbs back up the silk tether. Jumping spiders do not necessarily follow a straight path in approaching prey. They may follow a circuitous course, sometimes even a course that takes the hunter through regions from which the prey is not visible. Such complex adaptive behavior is hard to reconcile with an organism that has such a tiny brain, but some jumping spiders, in particular some species of Portia, can negotiate long detours from one bush down to the ground, then up the stem of another bush, to capture a prey item on a particular leaf. Such behavior still is the subject of research." End quote. This study found learning in one species of jumping spider. The study examined, quote, the challenging task of associating prey with color cues in a tea maze. Experimental spiders were given the opportunity to learn that a cricket was hidden behind a block of a particular color, end quote. The authors found that these, quote, jumping spiders were significantly more likely to look behind a block that visually predicted the presence of prey when they had an adequate number of successful training trials to gain this experience, end quote. Finally, this study looked at the behavior of one type of jumping spider in response to video images of prey and other spiders. Quote, results from this study suggest that jumping spiders interpret video images as real because, one, Spiders did not discriminate between live prey and its simultaneously presented video image, and two, they behave appropriately when presented with televised images of prey insects, e.g. stalk and attack televised prey, conspecifics, e.g. courtship and sexual receptivity behavior directed toward televised conspecifics, and heterospecific jumping spider species, e.g. retreat from predator stimulus." End quote. As you can see here, there are some bugs on the gravel of my driveway. Likewise, there would probably be some bugs on a gravel lawn. But the key point is that all these bugs eat food that ultimately derives from autotrophs, such as the grass and trees on a lawn. So a gravel lawn dramatically reduces bug populations in general, even if there would still be some bugs on the lawn itself. I scooped one of these tan bugs up and brought it inside for a closer look. I think this is the same species as we saw before, but maybe it's slightly different. Here's a fly. Here's another member of the order Diptera, maybe a fungus gnat. Here's an ant's nest and an ant. I moved from my front step toward a tree along the driveway. Here's the ground in front of it. And next I'll show inside a hole in the tree. You can see some kind of bug crawling in here, maybe to escape the light of the microscope camera, or maybe it was just moving around anyway. Next I went to an apple tree by the road. It had flowers blooming, which attracted a honeybee. Bees are arguably some of the smartest insects. They have about one million neurons and display cognitive generalization in choice tasks. There are many studies demonstrating bee intelligence. Here's one snippet from this page. Quote, two groups of bees, foragers from the same hive, were trained to two food sources one on the shore and one in the middle of a lake. When the food quality was increased at both feeders, both groups of bees danced in the hive 
to tell the rest of the bees where to get the good food. The bees watching the shore feeder dance went out and ate at the shore feeder. Perhaps the bees watching the lake feeder dance thought, flowers in the middle of a lake? This gal must be nuts, and very few bees went to the lake feeder. So at this point you're thinking those bees just didn't want to fly out over a smelly lake? Well, the thoughtful researchers decided to try the experiment again and moved the lake feeder close to the opposite shore, although still surrounded by plenty of water. That time, the bees seemed to have thought the food source to be in a more plausible spot, and following the dance, lots of bees went to both feeders. End quote. This looks to me like another leaf hopper, although a different species than we saw at the beginning of this video. You can see it demonstrate its name as it hops off the leaf here. While filming, an insect began sucking blood from my leg. It seems to be a black fly. According to this page, quote, after taking a blood meal, females develop a single batch of 200 to 500 eggs. Adults of most species are active from mid-May to July. The number of generations completed in one year varies among species, with some having only one generation, but most species that are major pests complete several generations per year. Male black flies are not attracted to humans, and their mouth parts are not capable of biting. The restoration of polluted streams, especially in New England, has increased the dissolved oxygen content of streams and created suitable larval habitat for some of our most important pest species." End quote. Because this was probably a female getting a blood meal in order to lay eggs, I didn't want it to get more blood food, because that would create more future offspring. So I tried to blow the fly off me. When that failed, I picked it off with my fingers. I don't think that I injured it in the process. Once the fly was removed, blood came out from the bite region. Here's some more information on black flies, quoted from the same article as before. Quote, Black flies can be annoying, biting pests, but none are known to transmit disease agents to humans in the U.S. In parts of the upper Midwest and the Northeast, black fly biting can be so extreme, especially in late spring into early summer, it may disrupt or prevent outdoor activities. When numerous enough, black flies have caused suffocation by crawling into the nose and throat of pastured animals. End quote. Here you can see the bite wound about 10 minutes after the fly had gone. Here are froth bubbles on a plant, presumably from a spittle bug. This article explains that frog hoppers, quote, are best known for the nymph stage, which produces a cover of frothed up plant sap resembling saliva. The nymphs are therefore commonly known as spittle bugs, and their froth as cuckoo spit frog spit, or snake spit. The froth serves a number of purposes. It hides the nymph from the view of predators and parasites. It insulates against heat and cold, thus providing thermal control and also moisture control. Without the froth, the insect would very quickly dry up. The nymphs pierce plants and suck sap, causing very little damage. Much of the filtered fluids go into the production of the froth which has an acrid taste, deterring predators." End quote. This looks like a wood louse. They're actually crustaceans rather than insects. They eat mostly dead vegetation. Now we get to what is arguably the star of this video, springtails, formerly called columbula. Here's one on a blade of grass. These were by far the most numerous arthropods that I found outside with ants perhaps coming in at a distant second place. These animals get their name from the behavior shown here. When threatened, springtails jump using a spring-like appendage called the furcula. According to this page, quote, the organ most often is present in species of columbula that live in the upper soil layers. 
The animal does not use this mechanism for locomotion, but only for escaping from predators or severe stress. One reason not to use the furcula for general locomotion, other than to escape threats, is that its action is very unpredictable. When the furcula is released, the springtail is sent tumbling through the air on a practically arbitrary trajectory and lands almost randomly. That may have advantages in escaping some forms of attack, but is not of much use in adopting any particular route. Although the action of the furcula is hard to predict, it is versatile. Even a springtail drifting on the surface tension of a layer of water often can jump successfully. Furthermore, the furcula is effective in environments typical of columbola. Most predators of springtails are small, and many have little power of sight, so if the prey leaps in time, the chances are that, from the hunter's point of view, it simply vanishes." End quote. This springtail was walking around the edge of the entrance to an ant burrow. You can see how adept it is at grabbing on to the soil to avoid falling. I find it astonishing that such a small animal can perform this well at climbing adaptively on such unstable ground. Springtails eat things like fungal spores, algae, insect poop, and decaying vegetation. I'm not sure what these particular yellow springtails were eating. According to this page, quote, it is not uncommon to witness thousands to millions of springtails emerging from the ground when it becomes too dry or too saturated after a large amount of rain. Female springtails lay their eggs in moist areas, like in soil or underneath mulch, grass, or leaf piles. When the larvae hatch, they will molt up to ten times before maturing into an adult. This process generally takes two to three months, but depending on the environmental conditions, it can sometimes take up to two years to complete. Once the springtails have matured into adults, they will continue to molt throughout their lifetime. They feed on things like decaying vegetation, fungi, bacteria, pollen, and insect feces." End quote. This page adds, quote, Green spaces, nurseries, gardens, and even golf courses can provide homes for springtails. Maintenance crews sometimes find springtails in malls, hotels, and office buildings, where they can be imported with potted plants." End quote. A third page explains, quote, Springtails live in soil, especially soil amended with compost, in leaf litter and organic mulches, and under bark or decaying wood. They feed on decaying plant material, fungi, molds, or algae. They are also found on the surface of stagnant water or on sidewalks that border flower beds or swimming pools. Most springtails are harmless scavengers, feeding mainly on decaying organic matter. Some species may damage plants by chewing on the roots and leaves of seedlings." End quote. This article says, quote, Springtails are not as important as earthworms in fueling decomposition but are responsible for between 1% and 30% of total soil invertebrate respiration, depending on the habitat. A typical figure for temperate woodland is 6%. Columbula that live in trees graze on algae and lichens from the surface of bark, and there are several species that prey on other columbula and their eggs. Most habitats are home to at least 20 to 30 different species, Populations are usually comprised of two or three hyperabundant species, along with a number of rarer taxa. In the tropics, up to 150 species have been found per square meter when the numerous individuals living in epiphytes in the trees are taken into account. The oldest fossil columbula, which is the oldest fossil insect known, is a species called Rhyniella precursor from the Rhiney chert in Scotland of 400 million years in age. A large number of columbula specimens have been found preserved in amber dating to about 40 million years. These specimens do not differ much from their modern descendants. Amber from the Cretaceous period about 100 million years ago has also preserved a range of columbula specimens, 
some of which are extremely unusual and have features not found in present-day species. It has been suggested that, as with the dinosaurs, there were many diverse evolutionary lines of Columbula that died out at the end of the Cretaceous during the major extinction event that took place 65 million years ago. End quote. The Wikipedia article on springtails explains that some orders of springtails are elongated, while others are globular, that is, more round. Most of the springtails in this video seem to be globular. Following are more snippets of information about springtails, quoted from the Wikipedia article. Quote, Columbulins are omnivorous, free-living organisms that prefer moist conditions. They do not directly engage in the decomposition of organic matter, but contribute to it indirectly through the fragmentation of organic matter and the control of soil microbial communities. Springtails are attested to since the early Devonian. Springtails commonly consume fungal hyphae and spores, but also have been found to consume plant material and pollen, animal remains, colloidal materials, minerals, and bacteria. Springtails are cryptozoa, frequently found in leaf litter and other decaying material, where they are primarily detritivores and microbivores, and one of the main biological agents responsible for the control and dissemination of soil microorganisms. In sheer numbers, they are reputed to be one of the most abundant of all macroscopic animals, with estimates of 100,000 individuals per square meter of ground essentially everywhere on Earth where soil and related habitats, moss cushions, fallen wood, grass tufts, ant and termite nests, occur. Only nematodes, crustaceans, and mites are likely to have global populations of similar magnitude. Sexual reproduction occurs through the clustered or scattered deposition of spermatophores by male adults. Many columbulin species, mostly those living in deeper soil horizons, are parthenogenetic, which favors reproduction to the detriment of genetic diversity and thereby to population tolerance of environmental hazards. Parthenogenesis is under the control of symbiotic bacteria of the genus Wolbachia, which live, reproduce, and are carried in female reproductive organs and eggs of columbula." End quote. This study of pastures and hayfields reported, quote, a total of 14 species of columbula were identified from soil samples from a depth of 0 to 2 centimeters on 18 September 2004. Between 4,000 and 10,000 specimens per square meter of columbula were collected. The number of springtails in European grassland soils is similar to that of mites, over 100,000 specimens per square meter, Curry 1994, Hopkin 1997. In the present study, up to only 10,000 specimens per square meter of columbula were collected from soil. This low number is understandable as the activity of columbula decreases substantially in September when sampling took place. End quote. Another article confirms the estimates of springtail densities per square meter of between 10 to the 4th and 10 to the 5th. In conclusion, this video has shown the immense numbers of bugs that live in even an ordinary lawn, as well as surrounding trees and flowers. One takeaway lesson is that walking on grass is liable to injure, maim, and kill tons of bugs, which is why I try to avoid walking on grass, except in extreme circumstances. It's also why I don't go for walks in the woods or outdoors in general, apart from on pavement. A second lesson is that preventing plant growth on your lawn or nearby trees can make a big difference to bug suffering. If I have my own lawn in the future, I plan to cover it with gravel, which should prevent at least hundreds of thousands of bugs every year from being born without their consent into situations where they will soon face painful deaths. This completes the verbal section of this video. Now I'll show some extra footage that wasn't included in the main presentation, but feel free to stop at this point.